Okay. So um, again, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Soichi Oya from Saitama Medical University. And uh, um, today I'm going to talk about the skull based techniques for cerebral aneurysms. Um, the technique I'm going to show today is nothing fancy. However, uh, it's very important, very critical in the treatment of cerebral aneurysms. Okay, um, now it's the era of endovascular surgery. And uh, you know, as we all know, it has been playing the pivotal role in aneurysm treatment. However, um, I think the uh, open surgery still uh, is required need for some selected cases. Uh, for example, um, you know, MCA aneurysms are good candidates. Um, there are all the previous literatures to date advocate their uh, open surgery over endovascular surgery. And also are uh, large to giant aneurysms arising at the uh, non-ICA intracranial arteries. In addition, um, however, the extremely small aneurysms with wide neck, including the uh, broad breast like aneurysm. And uh, in addition to these aneurysms, uh, today I'm going to focus on some um, specific cases like uh, um, ICA aneurysm causing visual deficits and uh, aneurysm requiring sacrifice of the parent artery. And also I'm going to talk about some aneurysms in young patients requiring complicated endovascular procedures. Uh, these characters, these sentences um, highlighted with uh, pink color, these are the reason to choose the uh, open surgery. Before I start the case presentation, let me begin with um, explaining the rationale of our orbital zygomatic approach. So the question is, when do you need uh, orbital zygomatic approach? My answer is uh, when you wanna have a, a lookup view with minimal brain retraction. So this is the ov orbital zygomatic, you know, the direction. So the indications include a craniopharyngiomas or high position basal top aneurysms or high positioned echom aneurysms from a terminal approach. I uh, in my opinion, the meningiomas, uh, we do use the, uh, um, not frequently use the uh, orbital zygomatic approach because we can use the uh, um, space uh, that's already being created by tumor itself. So the first case is a high positioned basal top aneurysm. Uh, this was a ruptured case. Uh, this patient was a 66 year old lady. Uh, she had a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. As you see here, that uh, the aneurysm was formed at the top of the aneurysm. Um, the definition of a high position uh, is, called, is said to be the uh, 10 millimeter or higher from the anti-acrinoid and the posterior crinoid line, which is also called the ACPC line. In this case, the distance from the ACPC line to the neck of the aneurysm was 18 millimeter. So what we utilized the uh, orbital zygomatic approach, the uh, microscopic part was uh, already done. And now I'm cut, this is a right side approach and uh, I'm cutting the meningo orbital band. And also uh, I'm drilling the uh, and open the superior orbital fissure Look here, the optic canal roof is extremely thin. Sometimes uh, we uh, encounter this type of uh, optic canal and we just added a slight uh, drain of the uh, optic roof. And also I'm removing the uh, anterior cranial process. Um, if we have some difficulty to removing the uh, anterior cranial process, uh, let me advise you to add a little bit drain on the uh, optic strut. And then um, I open the uh, uh, dura. And uh, you know, um, I think the, um, having the uh, radar view to the aneurysm is important to look up the aneurysm. And uh, so uh, to uh, 
uh, fulfill this purpose. I think the uh, cutting the arachnoid covering the, uh, you know, uh, middle cerebral artery, uh, I mean, the uh, veins, superficial middle cerebral veins or MCAs or anterior temporal artery, that's critical. Now I'm cutting the uh, thick arachnoid covering the uh, cerebral veins. By uh, removing this, cutting this uh, thick arachnoid, I can get uh, this view. This is a, a still, this is a, a pre, um, I mean, the terrional view. If you have a correct direction, you, uh, the uh, M1 should come in the center of your operative field. Now this is the optic nerve, this is uh, A2. And also uh, removing the crot in the subarachnoid space is very important. And by, you know, isolating these vessels, including arteries and veins. Now I can retract the temporal row posteriorly like this. Look at the tip of the retractor. This is onto the uh, uh, contacting the uh, uh, tentorium. And the next step is to cut the uh, distal dural ring. By doing this, I can mobilize the uh, ICA medially and so that I can expand the space posterior to the ICA, which is also called the retrocarded space. You may encounter some um, uh, breathing from a cavernous sinus by cutting the uh, um, distal dual ring. But now, you know, I'm starting the uh, retracting the temporal row posteriorly. And the next step is to cutting the uh, thick arachnoid membrane covering the uh, ochromotor nerve. By doing this, you can untether the uh, temporal roof and also you can uh, you know, free the uh, ochromotor nerve. And this is the ipsilateral SCA, basal trunk here. Now, you know, I'm retracting the ICA like this. And now I'm confirming that I can put, I could put the uh, temporary clip onto the uh, basal trunk. And I just simulated the insertion of the uh, clip. This is the uh, PCOM and the P1 and P2 junction. And this is the dome of the Anderson. Uh, look, you can uh, create the uh, ample space here. And then um, I apply the temporary clip and I also protect the uh, ICA and I put the retractor here. Now I could use the both hands and uh, I'm checking and you know, they're exposing the uh, neck. And this is a perforator. And uh, now I'm checking there is no perforator around the neck. And I insert the small uh, main curved uh, blaze clip here. Once you create a wide ample space here, uh, the clipping is not, not uh, you know, formidable, difficult. The perforators are preserved and they look good. And the interoperative video and geography showed the uh, disappearance of the aneurysm and the good patency of the P2, uh, both P1. And the MAP was fine. And at the last step, uh, in Japan, uh, we uh, frequently use the uh, cisternal drainage to control the uh, intracranial pressure. So I put the cisternal drain here. So uh, the post-operative uh, imaging showed uh, complete disappearance of the aneurysm. So next I'm going to talk about the uh, ICA aneurysm causing visual deficits. You know, the, uh, uh, to uh, prevent the uh, rupture is uh, very important. However, uh, we also have to uh, improve the uh, neurological deficits. Uh, for this type of aneurysm, I think uh, the endovascular surgery um, has been um, unsatisfactory yet. So uh, for some mm -hmm. selected cases, I think the uh, um, clipping may, uh, may be a, a useful solution. 
And uh, this patient was a 77 year old lady um, complaining of a left side uh, visual deficits caused by the ICA paracranial aneurysm here. So uh, uh, this is the left side approach. And, you know, let me show you how I confirm the location of the aneurysm first before I actually uh, perform the uh, extra dural drilling of the supernoid bone. And then um, I'm drilling the uh, supernoid wing. And, uh, you know, I can just uh, repetitively check the uh, location of the aneurysm like this. And now, you know, I'm dissecting the, uh, the aneurysm here. This is the optic nerve. This was the discolored portion. And this is the distal part of the ICA. And now I'm coagulating the, the dura covering the optic canal. And uh, you have to be uh, careful uh, when drill this portion because the, uh, you know, right underneath this bone, um, the optic nerve is uh, running. And also uh, this has been already damaged by long-term compression due to by the, uh, um, the aneurysm. You know, this is the first form ligament. And by carefully opening the first form ligament, um, you, can, you can see the dent here. This is the most vulnerable part of, uh, of, the, of the optic nerve. And now I'm trying to uh, create a space here and uh, do not hesitate to remove the dura uh, in this portion because uh, uh, in the first place, it, it's impossible to uh, close the dura in a watertight fashion here. So all you have to uh, do is to uh, repair the open the paranasal sinus. And by removing the dura, you can get the uh, wide space here and everything is clear. And uh, before starting the dissection from the aneurysm uh, off of the optic nerve, I put a temporary clip here. And also I, I clamp the uh, cervical ICA to reduce the pressure. And I try not to push the optic nerve. I try to be gentle as possible. And I apply the first clip but this was too close to the neck of the uh, ICA, uh, the aneurysm, I, I, close to the ICA. So I, I chose to the second clip and remove the, uh, the first clip. And uh, there was no info confirmed into the aneurysm. And uh, uh, complete obliteration. Unfortunately, uh, her visual field cut did not improve after surgery. However, uh, her visual acuity improved from 60 over 100 to 90 over 100. Uh, for this surgery, uh, we utilized visual evoked potential, VEP. Um, while I secured the space between the optic nerve and the annulus wall, uh, I clamped the cervical ICA. While clamping the cervical ICA, uh, the, uh, the amplitude of the VEP has decreased on both sides. This is control. However, uh, it recovered immediately after declamping, which means this decrease of the VEP amplitude is not from the mechanical injury to the optic mm -hmm. nerve wire dissection but from the uh, uh, temporary ischemia, ischemic defect. So we're um, using um, this evaluation repetitively, uh, you know, while dissecting, um, we were sure that uh, we were on the right track in treating, dealing with the uh, optic nerve. So uh, this, I think um, this um, assurance, reassurance is good for surgeon's mental health, right? So our key techniques for um, ICA aneurysms causing visual deficits, I think are um, anterior craniodectomy prior to manipulating the optic nerve to reduce the additional damage and a minimal dissection of the optic nerve. 
And also, if possible, um, in some cases, visually evoked potential monitoring is uh, helpful. Next topic is the uh, aneurysms requiring sacrifice of the parent artery. Um, in this regard, I think the uh, blood breed select aneurysm or ICA anterior wall aneurysms are very uh, well known. However, um, today I'm going to show a case of uh, fused form aneurysm of a uh, right side superior cerebral artery. Uh, showing their interval growth over five years from three millimeters to eight millimeters. You know, that, um, considering the disproportion of the size of the parent artery and the size of the aneurysm, um, I think it indicates that the higher possibility of the future um, rupture. So where we had our um, you know, the thorough discussion about uh, the treatment options. Our endovascular surgery team said that uh, they have had to sacrifice the right side superior cerebral artery. But in uh, literature, um, some ischemic symptoms can occur by, uh, you know, sacrificing their uh, SCA because of their uh, um, occlusion of the perforators from the SCA to the brainstem. So we had a discussion with our patient and she chose to have the open surgery uh, consisting of the uh, um, SDA, SCA bypass and the trapping of the fused cell manuals. Um, for this surgery, uh, we chose the anterior transpetrosectomy using the extra on the intradural approach. So um, the patient was placed on the uh, supine position and her neck was uh, rotated to the left. And uh, uh, this is a two uh, layer dissection and uh, you know, the transzygomatic approach and the temporal muscle was reflected as lower as possible. This is the supramastoid crest, which corresponds to the height of the temporal, the tegument of the temporal bone. This is the facial here, this and the GSPN. I'm checking the course of the facial nerve by uh, facial nerve stimulation. And uh, this is the uh, so-called uh, Kawasis lombard. And uh, now I'm drilling the Kawasis lombard. And when I complete about 80 or 90% of the drilling uh, procedure, uh, I just uh, open the ear. Uh, dura covering the temporal robe. And uh, using the space I have already created, I cut the uh, temporal, uh, I mean the uh, tentorium. And you see here, this is the fourth nerve. And I ex I'm exposing the fourth nerve and I moved anteriorly and I found the ICA and uh, this is the uh, ochromotor nerve. And uh, this is the proximal SCA. And the aneurysm is here. And this is fourth nerve again. And the next, uh, I cut the tintorium a little bit more and uh, I uh, removed the, uh, I drilled the uh, the last tip of the uh, uh, Petra's apex. So as you see here, uh, by during the, uh, un, you know, the Petra's apex, uh, I could um, have, a, I could obtain an ample space for uh, making an osmosis. By doing this, I think, um, you know, as you see here, uh, you know, uh, we can avoid the uh, too much retraction of the temporal roof. And also, you know, um, for uh, this type of uh, deep anastomosis, I think it would be advantage if we can lay the donor oddly uh, from right or from left, you know, like this, uh, so that we can enhance the visualization uh, of the site of the anastomosis. And also, uh, you know, um, you can have, uh, 
you know, ample space to insert surgical instruments from various directions. Now I'm releasing the, uh, the parent artery four. And uh, I apply the clip, permanent clip to the distal, uh, the distal to the uh, aneurysm. And ICG video and geography showed a good patency fire uh, the donor artery. And the last step, I added the crib, another crib to the super, um, proximal portion of the superior cerebral artery. And she had no uh, infarction, fortunately. And the post-operative CD, CD angiography showed the uh, bypass uh, vessel here. So we're, um, for aneurysms requiring sacrifice of the parent artery, I think reconstruction of the parent artery should always be considered. Now for CSC bypass, I think intradural anterior pitrosectomy provides a better angle for bypass instruments, also uh, mitigate the temporal of retraction. Uh, we reported uh, this case uh, to the uh, Journal of Neurosurgical Focus and uh, we uh, showed the significant increase of their uh, working space here. Uh, I think the uh, endovascular surgery is the treatment option for most aneurysms. However, for some selected and complicated aneurysm, uh, clipping it, uh, may provide a uh, much simpler and a more definitive solution, especially for young patients. So uh, this patient was a 40 year old lady uh, who had subarachnoid hemorrhage due to the ruptured uh, VA union aneurysm here. And uh, you know, this aneurysm project uh, anteriorly, anteriorly and posteriorly is very complicated aneurysm. And it's not easy even for uh, endovascular surgeon to uh, obliterate this aneurysm. So we chose uh, the direct surgery uh, consisting of uh, a combined transpetrous approach. Combined means the combination of the uh, um, transcondylar approach and the posterior uh, uh, transpetrous approach. So this is condyle. And then I am removing the root of the condyle. And this is the condylar emissary vein, which was nicely controlled. And this is the hypogrossal canal. And uh, after this part is done, I moved to the uh, uh, transpetrous approach part. Uh, this is the uh, antrum and the lateral semicircular canal here. Um, let me emphasize that uh, for vascular surgery, I think, um, um, ag aggressive drilling is important because uh, you may require, you may need a little bit more, a little bit more wider, you know, space to accommodate the clip or temporary clip or larger suction tube. And uh, so, uh, in case you know you you have um, massive bleeding while you're dissecting the aneurysm or something like that, you you have to. Um, draw these parts. And this is a facial nerve. And also I, op I opened the uh, internal auditory canal here. And uh, this will, um, you know, teach uh, what kind of nerve around here that this is the fifth nerve. So the vagal trunk should be uh, ventral to the fifth nerve here. So I think I will be able to uh, secure the vaginal trunk uh, when I uh, have to, you know, the temporarily occlude the vaginal trunk. And now I open the uh, the dura, and I cut the uh, arachnoid under. This is a lower cranial nerve.
And this is the eighth nerve and the seventh nerve behind the eighth nerve. And this is the proximal portion of the VA. And now I'm approaching the uh, annulus. Annulus is here. This is the ipsilateral of VA. This third portion of VA. This is the beginning of the, uh, the annulus, this lingual part. This is the surgical view. Now I'm preserving the perforators. These are very important perforators. And look, um, I apply the uh, retractor on the brainstem. I know, you know, we uh, we have to we, yeah. Normally, we should avoid uh, this type of usage, but uh, to create the uh, space here, uh, anterior to the brainstem, I have to I had to do this. And this is the portion of the, uh, the left loop here. The, my plan is put the first clip um, to close the uh, left half of the neck together with the uh, left uh, loop structure here. Now I'm applying the first clip to creating the closure line half here by doing this, I could uh, get the additional space to cut the arachnoid and the confirm the perforators around the uh, aneurysm. And uh, I cut the arachnoid uh, close to the uh, left, right side of the aneurysm neck. And uh, next I use the uh, fenestrate grip to jump the first grip and close the uh, right half of the uh, aneurysm neck. And as for monitoring, uh, we use the uh, MAP and SCP for this surgery. Uh, this is clot and uh, this is also clot inside the dorm. The ICG showed the obliteration of the aneurysm. This is the uh, right half of the ring and the post-operatively uh, looks, um, it looks good. And the, she, she was discharged with no neurological deficit. And uh, this is the last case. Uh, she also had her um, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. She was young and uh, uh, ruptured VA union aneurysm. But in this case, the location was a little bit higher than the previous one. So we chose the uh, posterior pitrosa, uh, transpitrosa approach only. And uh, from this approach, from this case, I like to uh, emphasize the importance of uh, preservation of the venous drainage. So this is the left side approach, temporal rope here, and this is a posterior fossa, mass of the process. I'm starting with uh, um, a mastoidectomy. This is the antrum. And uh, this is the endolymphatic sac and I coagulate the orifice of the endolymphatic sac and uh, I cut it. <laughs> and uh, this is the, uh, the lateral semicircular canal and the posterior semicircular canal, superior semicircular canal. And uh, I drill the tip of the, uh, uh, the bone here. And now I'm confirming, you see here, this is the, uh, um, uh, Sigmoid sinus, which is patent. And again, uh, I'm trying to preserve this flow, petrosal veins, superior petrosal sinus, and the Sigmoid sinus. Uh, excuse me. So um, try to, uh, to preserve the route of petrosal vein, I cut the superior petrosal sinus uh, at the anterior portion. And then I'm, you know, approaching the uh, basal trunk, and the, to accommodate the clip head, I need to open the uh, uh, internal auditory canal too. And now I'm identify the uh, this is the distal basal trunk, and this is the aneurysm. And uh, I'm isolating the perforators here. Look, you can have a, a wide space here. And uh, 
now I'm confirming the uh, the Venus return is preserved like this. So uh, the uh, the energy was gone. Um, for uh, these types of uh, complicated vascular trunk aneurysm, I think, uh, um, you know, cr craniotomy uh, can be a definitive treatment, especially for young patients. And uh, um, combined transpetrosal approach uh, provides safe access to the proximal or the distal vascular trunk aneurysm, which is uh, one of the basics of the aneurysm surgery. And it also provides ample working space uh, even for the, uh, the location uh, around the vascular trunk. Um, these are the all um, presentations I prepare for today. Uh, creating a wide working space using a scar based technique is very important to increase, enhance the safety uh, to treat these aneurysms. And uh, you know, the clipping is still an um, important option, especially for young patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Oya. It was an exciting presentation. So beautifully you have demonstrated all the skull-based techniques. Really fortunate to have you here today. Professor Otani, would you like to comment? Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Oya, for your, you. uh, showing the so excellent uh, uh, technique uh, uh, for the skull base uh, techniques. So, uh, may may I ask a question? Yeah, of question? course. Sure. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. so uh, in uh, second cases of the uh, paracrinoid mm. aneurysm, uh, I, I think okay. it's uh, it might be the carotid cave aneurysm, mm. right? So how how is the uh, visual uh, visual uh, so function after the operation? I might uh, I might I am afraid uh, to uh, I am afraid to the uh, visual acuity will be uh, was worsening because uh, mm -hmm. so uh, that in the uh, that cases uh, the so ad adhesion of the between the aneurysm, aneurysm dome and the optic nerve is so severe, so severe. Okay. So I, okay. I usually I'm I might I might worsening the visual uh, acuity will be uh, worsening. So to detach yeah. only just only the detach the uh, aneurysm aneurysm dome from the optic mm. nerve. So uh, mm. do, do you think how do you think about the that cases so uh, in, in, in in your cases so it's just uh, subarachnoid the hemorrhage so i i think it's a uh, uh, so the, we have to uh, uh, secure the her her uh, uh, we, we have to save her her life but mm. in the uh, unrupture cases so I, mm. I will uh, ask. So do, do you think about that cases? So to... okay, mm. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking. Um, thank you. As for the location of the aneurysm, I think that's not the uh, um, carotid cave aneurysm. Uh, slightly distal to the uh, to the carotid cave. So I think uh, I, I I would prefer to call uh, paracrinoid aneurysm. And uh, you know that that was uh, the second case was an unruptured case, uh -huh. so uh, we did it uh, uh -huh. to you know aim for aiming for uh, the visual improvement. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah. of course, as you uh, pointed out, uh, we had a discussion with our patients about the risks of uh, visual you know worsening. However, um, at the same time, the result, treatment result outcome of the endovascular surgery is not that good. Uh -huh. So we're, uh, yeah, we had a, uh, this uh, discussion and uh, um, the key technique to preserve or, uh, or improve the uh, visual function for this type of aneurysm, I think, like I showed, uh, we have to um, decrease the pressure to the optic nerve as, as soon as possible even during surgery by removing the uh, optic uh, canal roof. 
before we actually uh, dissect the uh, uh, aneurysm from the optic nerve. And also we have to reduce the pressure by uh, trapping the ICA into our uh, aneurysm pressure. And then I know uh, my comment is a little bit uh, controversial, but uh, I try not to dissect the, uh, the uh, aneurysm wall from the uh, entire course of the optic nerve. All I have to get is the place to, you know, insert the clip brace. Uh -huh. So if if I um, dissect the aneurysm excessively, that might injure, uh, that might cause the visual worsening after surgery. So uh, if I think um, I could obtain a, the left space, um, I, I will I will stop it and I will move to the uh, clipping of the aneurysm. Thank you. I can end. Thank you, so Professor much. Thank, you Thank you very much. You. Thank you, Professor uh, Otani, for asking. I would like to say to Professor Oya that uh, the visual outcomes following clipping of paraclinoid aneurysms is uh, dealt with extensively in the literature. Uh, mm -hmm. In the present Asian Journal of Neurosurgery, there is an article written by me, which uh, has uh, their large series from Bantane, which is uh, the outcomes of uh, vision following clipping of paraclinoid aneurysms. As you had demonstrated that the patient did not improve the field cuts, that is because mm. of the long duration of the mm. impingement on the optic nerve. Right. The person who wrote it before me was Kamide et al. from the Baron Neurological under Dr. Lawton. He also mm. has uh, uh, summarized all the literature and he has also agreed to it that long duration of impingement is uh, patients who have this long duration are less likely to improve. And also, as you mm -hmm. said, that uh, we, uh, there you showed the visual evoke potentials. I, had, uh, I have written about VEP in that article. I have searched extensively. And it is said that VEP is very unreliable in prediction whether uh, there is a visual decline intraoperatively right. or not. Do you agree right. to it? Well, actually, uh, VEP, uh, you know, we, can't, we cannot rely on VEP to check the uh, mechanical injury. But uh, as for, I think, ischemic injury, like uh, closing the ophthalmic artery or something, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, if it's, this, is, this was not the case, but sometimes, uh, you know, the four, uh, you know, carotid cave aneurysms, uh, the ophthalmic artery might be involved uh, within the, uh, you know, the closure uh, line. And in the case, uh, I think a VEP um, can be helpful. But it, it's not good to detect the mechanical injury. Right. Professor Imad Kannan is with us from Saudi Arabia. Professor Imad Kannan, would you like to tell your comments, sir? Hi, how are you? I, I wish I was able to join you from the beginning, <laughs> uh, but I finished on time and I thought I should uh, join you on this uh, events. I'd like to commend uh, Professor Shoichi. Where is he? I don't see him now. Oh, fantastic oh, presentation. Hello, how are you? Hi, good, it's thank you. How good, are you? You look good. A wonderful mm -hmm. presentation. And uh, I learned a lot. You have much more experience in the vascular than me, myself. But oh. I think for the educational part, or perhaps if you can comment on the timing for the temporary clip, this is one, mm -hmm. and for the neck temporary clip, and how you are guided if you have to apply the temporary clip on the last case, the basal artery uh, mm. aneurysm. Uh, do you do uh, suppression? Do you do uh, on the giant one? The other question, suction decompression. Mm. Uh, these are some of the question I thought, the others they are shy to ask you, but I thought you might give a comment on this one. Okay. Uh, are you asking the uh, duration of the temporary clip? Yes. Okay. Okay. So for ICA, um, I usually uh, limit my time of a temporary clipping as five minutes. But uh, yeah, in uh, every case, I use the MEP. And uh, if there is no sign of ischemia, no, no sign of a motor paralysis, I may extend from five minutes to eight minutes or something, but never, uh, you know, extends to uh, extend to uh, uh, ten minutes. 
for Bajaratri, um, you know, my experience is uh, kind of limited. So I, I think I'm not qualified to make any comments, but uh, how about you? Uh, I think- uh, Well, uh, uh, no, my experience I told you is less than yours, uh, but um, you, you showed the challenging cases of the Beza art. Mm -hmm. They are not an easy cases to, to do, but you performed well. Now, um, it means for the middle civil art, you are guided by some kind of neurophysiological uh, changes. Mm. You, check, uh, you have a uh, motor evoke potential or somatosensory evoke potential to be guided that there is some, you said there is some changes in the motor function. How you are going to check it? It's a neurophysiological, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's for, what you uh, do. You do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For anterior circulation, you know, surgery, I only use the uh, motor evoked potential, transcranial. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This but is the a four, very right, right, right. But uh, for, uh, you know, posterior circulation lesions, I also yeah, use so SAP. But just in case, I'm not, you know, too. I'm not putting too much, you know, priority on the uh, SAP. You know. Yeah. The other small topic sometimes uh, I use when I learned it from Professor Yashagi many years ago, okay. the on-off temporary clip. So mm. you put the temporary clip, if you, as you said, past the five minutes, open it while you are not still uh, dealing too much with the aneurysm dissection. And then when you are near and need some of the perforator that are attached to the dome, then I reapply it again. So this is the on-off technique. It's a very oh, helpful okay. technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think I I'm using that too, yeah. I'm sure you'd use it with the subconscious. It's, in, uh, it's natural. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, wonderful to see you and a wonderful uh, thank presentation. You. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank I'm you. happy to see you here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Mark uh, Kannan. One more uh, thing which is to be mentioned is that before using the temporary clip, what sort of neuroprotection do you use? Because in uh, our, setup, okay. in our mm -hmm. setup, we usually give, you usually use the uh, preoperatively, we stick the BIS, that is bispectral index for monitoring, because we do not have MEP and SCP here. So depending upon the BIS, before temporary clipping, we bring down the BIS to around below 20, and then we apply the clip. Usually we use thiopenton okay. or uh, so what do you use mm. in your place? Do you use this? You obviously use no. MEP and SCP. No yeah, protection. MEP, SCP. Um, I'm not using this. And uh, I know some people use some are uh, 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 medication like uh, called, uh, it's the Japanese uh, pharmaceutical company. It's, uh, it's called a Legica. It's uh, like a free Legical scavenger. Uh, to reduce the uh, hazardous effect from reperfusion. But, uh, you know, I, th I think it's not um, too, it's not that popular. And uh, I actually, I'm not using any uh, medications to increase the protective effect, only uh, physiological monitoring. Right, thank you. Professor Kalangu, Professor Kazadi Kalangu, would you like to comment, sir? Yes, thank you very much, uh, you. Professor Soshi. Thank you very much thank for you. giving to me the opportunity to talk. And congratulations to Professor Soshi. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm losing your voice. You are muted, Professor Kalangu, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can oh, yeah. hear you. Please, Professor. Okay. I was saying congratulations to Professor Soshi for this uh, wonderful uh, Excellent presentation. Uh, we all le we always learn a lot, you know, from uh, from each other, and uh, I've learned a lot also myself. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I think uh, this this is, this is really uh, a fantastic, uh, you know, uh, presentation and a fantastic topic as well. So because it was presented so so easily, uh, but. Uh, the students they should also realize that it's not that easy operation mm. it, it, it is it, it looks very easy mm. but it's not that easy so you need really to have somebody who can uh, who can be nearby who can mentor you and who can teach you exactly how uh, to do it now uh, one of my question is uh, uh, 
how do you prevent uh, vasospasm in oh, your okay. patients? Oh, uh, I think, uh, you know, to usually I, like I said, I put the uh, cisternal drain to control the intracranial pressure. Okay. And also uh, during surgery, I try to remove the uh, clot in the subarachnoid okay. space as much as okay. possible. So that's okay. the big, in my opinion, that's the biggest advantage compared to the endovascular surgery. Okay. You know, not only clip the aneurysm, we can remove the clot. That's okay. another important you know, role of a, a di direct surgery. Okay. Thank That's you. Fantastic. Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kalangu's own uh, uh, student, Professor Aaron Mushara, who was with me, he wrote this article about uh, high riding basilar artery and clipping. So uh, during his time when this, uh, it is there in the AGNS, I think the previous issue. So when he wrote this article, we had extensively searched about uh, indications. And once uh, Professor Takizawa which was with us and we asked him that, uh, the, he clipped that aneurysm and uh, he did not uh, take off the zygomatic arch or orbital zygomatic, mm -hmm. plus a frontal temporal cramp craniotomy. So he was under the opinion that there, uh, he never uses this technique of uh, orbital zygomatic because he always retracts the temporal lobe and extensive arachnoid dissection and he unlocks mm -hmm. the brain axially and then clips it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also one more question regarding uh, OZ is that, do you ha have you had any complications for visual decline following orbital zygomatic craniotomy? Because uh, this is often a cited uh, uh, article from King's College London by Christopher Tolias who wrote that he had a case of blindness following external pressure to the eye during orbital zygomatic craniotomy. Do you have uh, you mean the, complications? Oh, oh, you mean the uh, um, visual worsening caused by the uh, eye pressure? Yeah. Uh, I can't, I think, uh, yeah, I have heard of it, but not um, in the case of our OZ approach, but uh, from the uh, bicornal approach, you know, bicornal skin incision. And that may, you know, um, push the eyeballs, you know, too hard, resulting yeah. in the uh, visual visual loss. Possible, possible. Yeah. Professor Ajit Sinha, would you like to come in, Professor Ajit Sinha? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Please, uh, please first please. of all, uh, uh, very congratulations for an excellent presentation and technically perfect. But Professor, I would much. like to ask you one thing: uh, Am I audible? Yeah, you are, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I want to ask, like, uh, nowadays is the era of, uh, you know, a lot of advancement in endovascular um, procedures. And the endovascular uh, surgeons, they always say that they can do everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, I am a neurosurgeon. I have a training in endovascular as well. So I, I just want to ask you a few questions, like, uh, uh, like the, uh, you know, the penetrated uh, vertebral artery aneurysm, which you showed and you flip very nicely. But uh, uh, being an endovascular person, somebody will say now P-conus is available and by using the P-conus, you can easily and very safely coil such aneurysm. Mm -hmm. So in your setup, how do you, uh, you know, how do you make in harmony with the endovascular guys? How do you decide that? Uh, this should be go to endovascular and this should go to surgery. Like nowadays, all uh, these uh, paraclinoid aneurysms, they are treating by flow diverters. And, right. uh, you know, they say that it is the most safe. So, mm -hmm. Your opinion. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your um, nice question. Uh, that, you know, that's all. I think the are boundly. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the territory of the uh, open surgery and endovascular surgery is overwrapping. But, uh, you know, if it's feasible, um, endovascular surgery is feasible, I think uh, uh, it should be, you know, the first treatment. That's my opinion. But the point is, um, I think the most important thing is to have nice partner, you know, 
who specializes in the endovascular surgery from the standpoint of the open surgeon, open you know, cranial meat surgeon. And we just discussed, and we all know the limitations of both approach. And then uh, we just um, you know, add some other information like uh, you know, the young patients who may require long-term antibi you know, uh, platelet therapy, which is not good for young patients basically. And uh, if you have a good skill of a skull based technique, you can create the ample space like MCA, even now the ICA or even other vertebral artery, you know, Anderson. And uh, so discussion with uh, such partners is critical to make a correct, you know, um, decision. And it should be like towards the more cryotomy line it might be, you know, sway to the more uh, endovascular line. It depends on the institution. I think there's no definitive, you know, yeah, solution. That is most important. Oh, you're seeing the case for the first time. Like for you, I'm sure all endovascular you can easily clip. And uh, for but for endovascular people, they again can, you know, they can say that uh, they can put fluid diverter in most of the Paraclonide aneurysms and the aneurysm right, will right, disappear. Right. They will come out with some data. So, what do you mm -hmm. see in future? What is the future of uh, the paraclonide aneurysm surgery? Uh, well, I guess the patients will decide it, and the patients will prefer the endovascular surgery. Right. Okay. Um, I know, you know, they're, uh, they like less invasive treatment. So uh, they, they will be decided by patients, you know. But uh, I, I believe that, the, uh, you know, they're, yeah, especially for um, large uh, paracranial aneurysms, not, not small one or medium one, large paracranial aneurysms causing visual deficits, I think still the open craniotomy has an important role. Okay, thank you. Okay, do I make sense? It was an excellent presentation and uh, very uh, uh, difficult cases you have shown and uh, obviously technically perfect presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank for you, your Dr. comment. Sinha. Thank you, Dr. Sinha for coming. Professor Imad Kannan, would you like to take a uh, uh, question about what is the future of uh, endovascular surgery and open surgery in paraclinoid aneurysms? to somebody else. Professor Hidehito Kimura is here. Professor Kimura, Professor Kimura is also an official translator of the <laughs> Yes, I'm here. Neurosurgery here. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Please, oh, sir. Hmm. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? So it's Professor Good. Oh, yeah. How are you? Yeah, thank you. Nice to see you here. Thank you. How are you? you? You're still the, uh, Good. Still Good. the so, yeah, COVID outbreak. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> It's for the first time in six months. Oh no, um, yeah. 10 months or something. Yeah, yeah. so long. Yeah, mm -hmm. still in Tokyo, it's so many patients is suffering. Of COVID yeah, yeah still. the number is yeah. increasing. Yeah. I'm just worrying about you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your nice presentation. And uh, I have so enjoyed your presentation and uh, sharing your oh, you. excellent surgical skills. Yeah, your surgical wow. skills are always so fine. Yeah, I'm so surprised, always surprised. And uh, yeah, this is my... I'll... Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. This is my question and uh, a comment. So what is important to, uh, in treating the paracrinal aneurysm? I also thinking about how to preserve the, not only the ophthalmic artery, but also the superior hypereal artery. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. In your video, you, I can't detect the superior hypereal artery, right. but however, the patients preserved the visual acuity post-operatively. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do you comment about this? question well, matter but uh, um, I made in that case I made my best effort to uh, yeah. you know look for the uh, superior hyperphysial artery around the neck I, I just omitted that yeah. part from my movie yeah. but uh, I uh, in that case I couldn't find um, you know their oh. uh, noticeable mm -hmm. um, uh, superior hypophysial arteries, so I just put the crap. But, uh, you know, based on my experience, like uh, um, not only aneurysm, but also uh, cranial pharyngiomas, and uh, mm -hmm. there's a paper 
uh, showing the uh, structure of the superior hypophysial artery. Uh, it, in most cases, it's, it's uh, creating the circular uh, structure. So if you, uh, yeah. you know, the oh. cut or occlude just one part of the circle, mm -hmm. Uh, that might not necessarily mean the uh, complete obliteration no. occlusion of the uh, superior hypophysiology. I'm a believer of the uh, the theory. I'm not sure if it's true for all the patients, but mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so yeah. if I, yeah, you know, of course I make my you know best to uh, find yeah. the uh, superior hypophysiology. Uh, yeah. But if I cannot find, um, uh -huh. I just I'm not so keen about finding it. Uh -huh. To achieve the best uh, confirmation to operate with super artery, the uh, full circumferential incision around the distal dual ring may be more mm. important. Maybe. Right. Mm. So sometimes we can we may encounter the uh, ophthalmic artery incision mm. uh, inciting around the distal dual ring. Right. It may be yeah. some, maybe sometimes cause the problem. So mm. my second question is, uh, um, VEP is very very effective to the for the treatment of the paracrinoid aneurysm, but I mm. think the post-operative delayed deterioration may be occur mm. sometimes to the patient. In the VEP, we can't detect the post-operative delayed de deterioration, maybe right, caused right. from the in, uh, ischemic event, but uh, yes. So how do you, do you have some comment to this problem? Right, I, yeah, I have heard um, the case, um, lots of cases no. with the delayed onset of the visual worsening after surgery, but uh, I personally have never had the experience. Oh, I see. So um, maybe um, my speculation is that I always try not to, you know, the occlude the cavernous sinus too much mm -hmm. by, you know, inserting the uh, like hemostats, like a gel form or, oh, or some other. Ocular, ocular congestion due to the yeah, ocular, congestion. Ocular congestion. Uh -huh. So ad otherwise, you know, it cannot be explained, you know, uh, or, or maybe vasospasm, the arterial vasospasm, but yeah. uh, mm. you know, it's, it's more plausible. I think a venous mm. uh, congestion uh, from yeah. the uh, too Thank much you. packing of the cavernous sinus. Mm -hmm. To avoid, um, should be, should be yeah, avoid. that's yeah. yeah. So uh, I try not to do it. So uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it yeah, it, if it really works. So Thank not, you for your fine, fine comment. Yeah, yeah. and please stay keep safe. Yeah, yeah, you too. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and you all too. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we are Uto. Thank you. Yeah, yeah because uh, as you said, keeping anything near that uh, region, any plugging of fat or any material to clear CSF mm -hmm. leak has been found to be a significant, significant factor for visual decline. In the paper mm. which came out from Sapporo uh, mm. about visual outcomes for paraclinal aneurysm. So, mm -hmm. yep. so, so, so yeah, it's perfectly right. Professor Imad Kanan, would you like to come in, Professor? Yeah, I, well, I am muted myself, actually. <laughs> yeah, please. Just please. to compliment Professor Oye about his recommendation opening the system, uh, this is what is the uh, Many years ago, Professor Yazajil has advised to open not only the system where you are dealing, but most of the uh, basal system to make it communicate and navigate the clots completely out because this is the major treatment mm. uh, as part of the treatment of the uh, vasospasm. But I was interested with the drainage he put in the basal system. Does he? This is always in the same location where he opened the the liquid membrane and to drain, this is the because it's the major confluent of CSF, or he varies his position. This is one question. The other question, the role of endoscopy to identify the tip of the clip from mm -hmm. the posterior part of the aneurysm. Uh, mm -hmm. Does he have this in uh, common practice in some of the cases? Okay, uh, the, as for the location of the cisternal drain, I um, almost always um, put the drain into the, uh, uh, I mean, the parapontine cistern, prepontine cistern, because, uh, you know, there's a big cisternal space there. Sure. And uh, so that it will probably, uh, you know, reduce the possibility of the of the obstruction, uh, unintentional obstruction of the drain. You know, some people open their, uh, um, the, 
the space, uh, I forgot the name. It's behind the chiasma, chiasm. Uh, Laminar terminals. Right. Lamina terminals. Lamina yeah. terminals, yes. Lamina terminals. And I think uh, it also um, the same idea, I think. Um, but uh, I prefer, even for uh, simple, um, like uh, ACOM aneurysm or ICPC aneurysm, I just, uh, you know, bother to open the uh, really kissed membrane to insert the uh, system, the system uh, drainage there. And the uh, second question, um, yeah, I sometimes use the uh, endoscope to confirm the location or confirm the uh, complete clipping, but it's very rare because uh, I always try to open widely and uh, uh, making, I try to make the shallow working space. And uh, I you know, flip the microscope like this and uh, I try to uh, check directly the, the tip of the, the uh, the clip, but the sometimes in their case. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Imak. And then I would like to say, Professor Yoko Kato is a huge proponent of uh, endoscopy in the use of ingress mm. surgery. And they regularly use the endoscopy during uh, to yeah. assess the completeness of the clipping. The previous uh, fellow professor, Dr. Mohsin Nuri, wrote a fine article about how endoscopy influences the final clipping and repositioning of the clips. This was a good series uh, okay. from Bantane, which came up. Uh, uh, one more question about that far lateral transcondylar approach you showed, Professor Roya. Yeah? Hmm. yeah, you showed the drilling of the condyle. So uh, how much do you actually drill the condyle? Because it's very controversial because in 2016, there came a paper in the JNS from uh, Shiba and et al. Who, so, who showed a series of 21 patients who did not have any instability. Even among these 21, there are five patients who had uh, condyle drilled more than 75% and they did not show any instability. A year later mm -hmm. from uh, uh, Salt Lake, Utah, there came a paper from uh, Marcus Mazur, which is often quoted in most of the articles that he did a study on cadaveric patients in nine patients, and they have demonstrated that occipital cervical instability does occur after more than one third of drilling of condyle. What is your opinion regarding this? Okay. Uh, firstly, I was impressed that your knowledge is you were walking dictionary, huh? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I, Probably I'm not able to answer your question, but I was taught by Professor Tomio Sasaki, uh, who is a specialist of a scar based surgery. And he told me uh, medial one third of a condyle can be drawn off. And I just uh, loyally, you know, the keep uh, his uh, secrets or his lesson. And uh, I, I, uh, fortunately, I've never experienced any, uh, you know, uh, problematic instability after this approach. Uh, probably uh, medial one third, which is close to 70%, right? Um, yeah. I think that's the uh, safe zone, I think. I, I have asked this question to Professor Takizawa previously when I was there okay. in Japan. Uh, and he has, he what did has he always say? stated, he said that drill as much as you want. Drill, <laughs> okay. what, yeah. drill what you want to see. <laughs> that is was, uh, yeah. that was that's, his, his yeah, sentiments that's... are recorded by uh, <laughs> various online lectures from the Seattle Science Foundation. You can see Johnny Delash also appears to concur this uh, uh, theory that you drill how much you want to see. <laughs> what would you like to say, <laughs> Professor Kanan? Well, I agree because it's very difficult to judge how much you drill, first of all. And always the recommendation, the medial one third, if it's needed. Um, but I agree with the statement that many of my colleagues in the skull based surgery say you drill whatever it's needed. And remember, mm. this is a still a unilateral approach. I mean, they are talking about instability and all this, but uh, it might give if you took the whole condyle, but most of the time you don't need to. So you drill as much as you, a tailored approach. This is the highly recommended approach you tailor it according to the case and how much you want to see 
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thank you. and Prime. Is Dr. Jyotish is here? Dr. Jyotish would like to come in, Professor? Professor Jyotish? Yes, sir. Can you hear Please me? Do. Yeah, we can hear you. Sir. Yeah. Please come. Sir. I just have uh, a technical uh, doubt about the planar drilling. Do you always do the drilling extradurally or the initial part ah, extradurally okay. and the final part, uh, final thing is intradurally or what? Okay, okay, thank you for your question. Uh, for tumor surgery, I always uh, do uh, extra dry drilling, but for the aneurysm, you know, I'm covered. So I always want to uh, confirm the projection or location of the aneurysm before I start drill. And uh, if I feel safe um, uh, in uh, during extra jury, I will go back to uh, during the extra dual part, but extra, via extra dual route, route. But, uh, you know, it depends on the projection and the size uh, of the aneurysm and the location of the aneurysm. And uh, if I feel um, unsafe in um, during extra jury, uh, I will come into the uh, intradural space and uh, drill the anterior process or of the canal roof uh, with looking the, uh, the, the aneurysm itself. Okay, thank so you, I use you. both. Yeah, thank you. Thank you when you, when you go extradurally, uh, how do you deal with the optics threat? Do you have any difficulty or face any problem uh, drilling the optic threat? Uh, no, no, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, um, to drill the optic strut, I use a smaller head of the drill, like a, a two millimeter or a three millimeter. Uh, if we use the smaller drill, I think uh, uh, it's not that uh, difficult to drill the optic strut. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank Professor you. Jyotish, for asking. This is, I think Professor Otani is here. Professor Otani showed ex exclusively extradural drilling. Professor Otani right. would like to. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor. So, as a question, I, I would like to ask you the, about the uh, so STA, SCA bypass. So, in, in your, in your uh, presentation, so, uh, so you uh, just uh, uh, so anterior, anterior petrosectomy. So, uh, would you please let me know the uh, the need the need to the uh, anterior petrosectomy for the STSJ bypass? So, because we usually uh, uh, so perform the uh, tentorial incision for the STSJ bypass, I think it's it's enough for me to do the uh, STSJ bypass. So, but I think. Uh, but in your presentation is very wide uh, exposure of the uh, operative field for the bypass uh, deep corridor, uh, but, but mm. the, uh, uh, operative field. So would you, would you let me know the, uh, the need, uh, so additional need of the uh, anticlinoidectomy for the STHMC bypass, uh, no, 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 STHMC bypass. Oh, okay. Uh, I think if you drill, if not not only cutting the tentorium, if you drill yeah, the yeah, tip, yeah, yeah, of, yeah. tip of the petrous apex, you can move, mobilize the SCA, you know, inferiorly, uh, In, rostrally, uh, uh, I mean the caudally, a uh, little bit more, you know, you can move the SCA. Mm, and by yeah, doing, yeah. by by moving the uh, SCA inferiorly, uh, you can reduce the uh, temporal lobe retraction. Oh. <laughs> it's only temporal. probably oh. five, millimeter, yeah. five millimeter or uh, well, less than one centimeter um, increase, but uh, it's uh, pretty significant, uh, you know, in such deep and uh, deep uh, anastomosis uh, procedure. So, uh, yeah. Uh, you can um, not only, you know, cutting the tentorium, you can um, move the SCA from the original position to like a five millimeter or less than one centimeter 
towards uh, towards uh, 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 caudary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you for your comment. Yes, uh, for hello. Yeah, yeah, excellent presentation. Good evening from Nepal. Uh, Hi, thank you. Uh, it was an excellent presentation from Dr. Weyer. I have a few questions regarding the use of lumbar drainage. Do you use preoperative lumbar drainage for major aneurysm or? No. You do not use? I, I do not use a lumbar drainage for, uh, for any case like this. Okay. Regarding that blindness, I would like to share my experience with one okay. atrial communicating artery aneurysm. It was a very clean cut, straightforward ACOM aneurysm clipping. There was no problem. I don't even remember touching the optic nerve, but postoperatively, the patient woke blind, complete blindness, NPL. Then we reviewed On the, the literature right, that time. Or this side? Uh, opposite side. Opposite side? Yeah. I went from the right terrenal approach. I always do modified OGO, take out the orbital bar. So it makes the clipping, you know, as you mentioned, to put the instru instrument and clip applicator. And she woke up one eye completely blind. And uh, then that time I had the opportunity to review the literature and actually it was reported from Korea also two cases reported from Korea. And their hypothesis was, you know, when you raise the flap and turn the temporal muscle inferiorly and towards the eye, then because of the external pressure, you could actually have blindness. And then from mm -hmm. that time onward, we started to put an eye cup, you know, and that was the recommendation. And we had started once we make the, we uh, put an eye cap, so that if you, even if you raise the flap inferiorly and towards the frontal side, I will not be compressed. That's the uh, thing I wanted to share with all of you. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Professor Sharma. But uh, actually, if you look at another angle, mm -hmm. uh, the final positioning the, where the clip rests may be yes. touching the optic nerve. Uh -huh. And that might have been a cause because I'm yeah. telling this because in the previous lectures of Professor Michael Lawton, he brought yeah. out this issue when one of the uh, same question was asked to him. And he also said that he has this similar experience where the patient had uh, one eye blind following clipping of aneurysm. And he said that because of the blade was resting on the optic nerve, he, uh -huh. he immediately went back in and he repositioned the clip followed by a recovery of the vision field. So that is also a possibility. And he said that blanching of the vessels of the optic nerve has been shown on ICG angiography when this rests. So one of the solution is that you take a 7080 proline switcher and tag it to the arachnoid of the uh, inferior frontal lobe so that the clip stays with the lobe rather than it pressing on the optic nerve. Mm. So that is one information. Very Are there any more questions, uh, please? If there are no more questions, then uh, we would like to wind up this session. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Oya for such an exciting presentation. Professor Otani Thank for sharing this session. For all the attendees who had great participation, Professor Imad Kannan, Professor Kasadi Kalanku, everyone contributed extensively of their, about their experiences. Thank you very much. We'll meet on next Saturday. We have Satoru Miyawaki, Professor from Tokyo University, who is going to speak about surgical treatment of Moya Moya disease. So until next Saturday, 6 p.m. Indian time and 9.30 p.m. Japanese time, we would uh, say goodbye to you, Professor uh, Oya, on behalf of the Education Committee and uh, Professor Yoko Kato, I sincerely extend my heartiest greetings for you. Be safe in this pandemic Thank and you. thanks for coming.